Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's Doing Business in Buffalo Niagara webinar, Western New York Electric Vehicle Charger Make Ready Incentive Program. My name is Sarah Larson. I'm the Marketing Manager here at Invest Buffalo Niagara, the Buffalo Niagara Region's Economic Development Organization. We will hold a Q&A at the end of our presentation today with our presenters, which at this time, I would like to introduce you to. From our Invest Buffalo Niagara offices, is Vice President of Business Development, Kim Grant. Kim has a strong background in business development. She has a strength in cultivating partnerships and works to both attract companies to the region and grow local businesses, often by identifying incentive sources. Kim and I are thrilled to welcome our guest presenters today. Whitney Skeens is a Senior Program Manager for Electric Vehicles at National Grid. Jim Calavota, is the Electric Vehicle Program Manager for NYSEG and RG&E. And we also have Ryan McPherson, Chief Sustainability Officer at the University at Buffalo. And now, without further ado, I'd like to toss the presentation over to Kim Grant to get us started. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Whitney, Jim, and Ryan for agreeing to be a part of this with us. I'll take just a quick moment to talk about Invest Buffalo Niagara. Uh, I have the best job in the whole wide world. I could not be more proud to represent the Buffalo Niagara region to the eight counties in our area, uh, starting from the west side of Rochester all the way to the Pennsylvania line and from uh, the Canadian border down to the Pennsylvania line. So it's a big territory. I will tell you that Invest Buffalo Niagara has had a record number of inquiries about our region, and many of those inquiries are around sustainable energy. You can see by proximity-wise um, how close we are to the rest of the, of the country, um, driving, train, um, we're really logistically perfectly placed. Um, Invest Buffalo Niagara focuses on a particular set of businesses, um, we see these as the, the greatest assets in our region, advanced business services. So if you think of the banking call centers, insurance, um, the back operations, everything happening at the Seneca One Tower and on our incubators uh, around tech, advanced manufacturing, more than 50% of the inquiries we get are around uh, low cost hydropower and actually making things for the rest of the world especially in light of the pandemic. Um, people are onshoring and reshoring and taking advantage of all the uh, advantages in our area. Agribusiness, you just can't plant corn in the middle of Manhattan. So you've got to come upstate and we've got everything from cows to corn to soy to grapes. Um, agribusiness is blooming and blossoming uh, as the case were. Life sciences, um, near and dear to my heart after my 10 years on the medical campus. Um, life sciences is thriving from therapeutics to diagnostics to medical devices and logistics. Like I said, we're close to everything um, and it makes it very practical and cost effective. You know, we say in, in Western New York, you're only 20 minutes away from everything. Um, and that certainly is important. We're getting approached by companies because we do have low cost hydropower. Our real estate is very affordable. Our skilled workforce, although we are suffering a little bit like the rest of the country with needing people to go back to work and get back to work and feel safe and comfortable, um, we have an extraordinary work ethic in our region. Um, and a low cost of living. More and more, we're finding that that work-life balance is so critically important. One of the things that we do at Invest Buffalo Niagara in attracting and helping our existing businesses is quarterbacking and shepherding our companies through the incentives process. Um, and so if you have any questions about any of these things, feel free to reach out to me. We have an extraordinary team. We are here to help. We have an extraordinary group of investors. Um, we are nonprofit. We are non-governmental. And we are put in place to help companies figure out how to drive revenues and, and uh, make capital investments and generate new jobs in our region. And a part of the way we do that is through our incentive programs. And we coordinate all of that on behalf of our companies. So um, as I introduce Ryan, um, I just wanted to set, tell you all that as recent as Tuesday, uh, 
there was an article in the Buffalo News that said Ford will build four factories in a big push for electric vehicles. How timely. Um, they're going to spend $11.4 billion and create 11,000 jobs. Uh, One million electric vehicles will be generated in the second half of this decade. And Tesla, which is on track to sell more than 800,000 electric cars this year, has become the most valuable automaker in the world by far. With a market capitalization of $800 billion, and Ford's market value is $56 billion. So this is coming, and to best set it up, um, I'd like to bring Ryan on to talk about his own personal experiences and what UB is doing with electric vehicles, bringing us into the future. Thanks so much, Kim and uh, Sarah. Thank you guys for your leadership in this space, and certainly to Whitney and Jim and National Grid and NYSEG and, and our partners at NYSERDA as well. Um, Kim, it, you know, we didn't rehearse this piece, but um, I'm psyched that you just referenced uh, those pieces about, I think it was about three years ago, brought Bill Ford Jr., um, uh, the great grandson of Henry Ford here to, to the university, uh, where he talked about the future of mobility. Um, and, you know, talk about a visionary. I think uh, if he had his way, he would have done this probably a decade ago, but I think bringing the rest of the world and his stakeholders and shareholders there. It's great to see them as well as the other auto manufacturers moving forward in this space. You know, I wanna to talk to you, kind of open things up with a personal story, hence why you are looking at a pair of boots right now uh, and have been for the last couple of minutes. Um, so 10 years ago, I, I bought my, my first um, electric vehicle and I really thought I was on the cutting edge um, at that point, but I quickly realized that I was on, somewhat on the bleeding edge. Um, while I really felt great about, you know, reducing the emissions and um, inner peace, joy and love, et cetera, I was quickly confronted in deep winter where I had to decide whether I wanted, you know, either to have enough charge to be able to get home to work or, um, you know, freezing my toes because it was either heat to keep the keep warm or enough mileage to get home. So let's just say I figured out that wearing my winter boots during, um, driving was was key to adapting in early EV use. Uh, a decade later, EV driving has really evolved dramatically. Um, ranges, as I think many of you know, have increased to upwards of 300 miles and automation has created greater safety and comfort. And while they're just, I think personally, a lot more fun to drive. And did I mention that they accelerate really, really fast and come with their own golden retriever? Well, maybe not the golden retriever, but they do accelerate quite, quite fast. So the first thing I'd like to do um, in our kind of tee up here is uh, to, to really talk a little bit about the why and to dispel, uh, I think probably what many of you may think like an institution like UB, like why are you doing EV adoption? And, and clearly, it is the, the right thing to do, if you will. That's important, but I, I thought it'd be important to express what's really driving us as an institution to transition uh, to electrification. Um, and I think these are very similar drivers in, in your world. Um, so the, the first one, of course, is the science and data, recruitment of excellent students and faculty, the business case, and the policy shift. So we are an institution of, of science and data. And the data is very, very clear in terms of the challenge that is presented to us uh, with climate change. And these are the three major findings from the latest report that some of our scientists at UB were part of. Um, and, and really what it boils down to is that we have a very unique window uh, to prevent things from getting uh, catastrophically worse. And the electrification of the vehicle is one of those key pieces. And so at UB, our carbon footprint looks a little something like this. Um, probably a little too detailed um, uh, for everyone to see, but the takeaway from, from our footprint is essentially that a third of our emissions, a little bit over that actually, are in the mobility sector. And it is the largest sector in the US right now when you look at the United States' carbon footprint. And so for us, our larger climate action strategy really comes down to 10 key areas that we are working to advance our mitigation efforts. And what you'll see one of those key areas, of course, is electrification of the vehicle. And the only way we can really get there in that is to electrify and use clean sources. The second um, piece is the recruitment of, of our customers, if you will, of, of great students and faculty. 
and a few kind of data points that you'll see here in terms of Generation Z demand. And this, this is very true for, for your products as well. Um, when you look at Millennials and Z, this is Z's, this is what the data is showing, right? 31% are actively boycotting unsustainable companies and, and really kind of voting with their dollars, if you will. And for us, 75% think that sustainability is an important factor with where to go to school. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you start to see some of the pessimism and cynicism, quite, quite honestly, of, of where their mindset is at. Um, and this is a really big challenge for us. So the more that we position ourselves um, to, to be ready, uh, to be able to take tangible steps and then show those steps, uh, the more likely that that is gonna resonate obviously with our customers. When we look at the business case, so we've looked at the science, we've looked at the, and the data, and we've looked at the, the kind of um, customer, if you will, for us as we're in, um, really analyzing, if you will, why we should be going into electrification, the totality of the analysis is, you know, yes, on the capital side, electric vehicles do cost a bit more, but when you take a life cycle approach uh, to that and an all-in analysis, you're really looking at lower fueling costs, especially with peer institutions like us who pay less, or as um, Kim said earlier, on uh, if you're working off of low-cost hydropower, there's a much less maintenance um, cost, uh, both time uh, not being used, but also obviously the dollars that go into that with electric vehicles. There's a lot of funding available, um, which Jim and Whitney will talk about today. And then of course, there's the brand enhancement overall for uh, what this does. And the final piece is really on the regulatory front. Um, so if it wasn't enough of uh, you know the science and the data pushing us that way, the customers and the business case, um, Governor Hochul just signed into law a uh, zero emissions requirement by 2035. And uh, the key here is that, you know, knowing that that's out there and strategically planning to move into that uh, so that it's not a surprise and that um, institutions and companies like yours can, can really um, be ready for that. So just in summary, if you're looking at this through a triple bottom line kind of analysis of thinking about the stewarding of uh, natural resources and clean air and those types of things, which include carbon emissions. If you're thinking about your people, uh, the intellectual capital that we have, and of course, if you're thinking about the bottom line in that analysis, electric vehicles just really make a lot of sense for us right now in terms of uh, where we are going. I had the easy job of teeing up uh, why we think you should take this journey. Um, I'm, not, I'm now gonna turn it over to Jim and Whitney who have the much tougher job of walking through the how you might be able to get there by partnering with your utility. Jim and Whitney. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the program background for our EV Make Ready programs. So the New York State Public Service Commission uh, issued an order uh, that was effective of July on July 16th of last year. And it's a very large program, uh, second only to California. The funding for it is uh, 700, a little over $700 million across the New York, the six New York State joint utilities and all of the JU uh, utilities are participants uh, in the EV Make Ready program. So this provides a, just an overview of the various aspects of the program. The goal is to deploy over 50,000 EV plugs throughout the state. Uh, there is a future-proofing aspect to it. To future-proof your site, which would be uh, future-proofing it for additional chargers in the future or greater charging capacity, the utilities will fund up to 10% of your eligible make-ready costs for that future-proofing. There's a fleet assessment service, was, which looks at, does a rate impact analysis and also a site feasibility analysis. There's a transit agency make ready part of the program, which supports electrification of transit buses uh, around the state. There's also a, a small medium and heavy duty make ready program. And that focuses on medium and heavy duty vehicles with some criteria that we'll talk about a little later. And also NYSERDA uh, has a funding for prizes, primarily focused in disadvantaged communities. Um, in terms of benefits, I think the benefits are, are wide and varied, and it really depends on the organizations or the municipalities who are interested in establishing charging at their locations. So it may mean that uh, your organization or your municipality has very strong sustainability goals, and this can help meet those goals. Uh, for retail businesses, it can be, you can attract customers to come to your site. 
um, for workplaces, it's a nice uh, amenity for employees. And also we see workplaces open up charging to the public if they're, for example, in a small community um, and they wanna support the public in their community, uh, they can make those open to the public. And also for apartment complexes or condos, Oh, this can be establishing charging at those can be a good a, a good sales proposition and may attract people to your site. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Whitney Skeens with National Grid. Thanks uh, to our hosts, the uh, Invest Buffalo Niagara, and as well Jim and Ryan. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is make ready. Um, this is probably the first time you've heard that terminology. So, what do we mean by make ready? Uh, we mean that it covers any infrastructure that's really needed to prepare the site for the stations themselves. So whatever it takes to connect the power source to the charging station, both utility side infrastructure as well as customer side infrastructure. I like to think of utility side as anything from the pole to the meter, um, including any transformer upgrades, meters, conduit, conductors, and then also from the customer side, we're looking at anything from the meter to the location of the station. So um, th any panel, uh, a new, new boring or trenching conduit, we're running additional line from your meter to the site where the stations will be located. And you can see we cover both those utility side infrastructure and customer side infrastructure. What we do not cover uh, are the soft side of costs, which is the hardware portion, as well as any signs, ballards, um, the subscription fees, and the maintenance going forward. Uh, as a station owner, uh, you will be responsible for those costs. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time here on this eligibility criteria and look forward to following up with any folks out there that are interested in, in kind of stepping through the details Essentially, for the Make Ready programs, both uh, National Grids, NYSEGS, and the other joint utilities, the eligibility is for any electric business customer uh, who is an account holder of one of those utilities. So even if, you're, if you are purchasing your electricity from a supply company, an ESCO, so long as you pay delivery to one of the joint utilities, including National Grid or NYSEG, you would be eligible to take on these incentives. Um, there is no maximum project size or total incentive cap per customer, so that's really great news, uh, but there is a minimum project size of at least two simultaneously charging plugs. Most stations have two plugs, and, uh, you know, we, we talk in plugs, but we're, you know, you're thinking stations, so I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, there are essentially two types of stations that we cover the, ins the infrastructure for, and those include level two stations and fast charging. So level twos are your standard charging station that you would most commonly see in retail, public destinations, workplaces. Um, it's a six to eight hour window to fully charge. A fast charger, oftentimes called level three or DC fast charger, is a 30 minute or less window to fully charge. You'll find those potentially along the highways and byways um, for road trippers. These are really critical to the infrastructure that supports EV drivership. Those um, projects are 10 times the cost and complexity. So as you can imagine, though we incentivize both level two and DCFC infrastructure, most of the projects are going to be level twos. Um, today, according to PlugShare, uh, there are 323 charging stations in the Buffalo, Chictawaga, Niagara Falls region. Only 32 of those are fast charging. The balance are level two. So just to give you some context. And also, if you're curious for context, according to the DMV this month, there are 4,200 registered EV drivers in both Niagara and Erie counties. Um, so that's about eight electric vehicles per level two plug. So we, we do have a long way to go. Infrastructure is critical uh, to getting folks comfortable with purchasing and driving EVs. So the level of the uh, incentive that we provide is based on two things, on public accessibility, and in special cases, the location of the station. 50% is covered uh, at for private, um, gated pay to park situations or proprietary plugs only. 
90%, which is the majority of projects that, are, that come through our program, are uh, awarded 90% because they are publicly accessible and also standard plug types. So any vehicle can pull up and charge. 100% uh, coverage is limited to two very specific project scenarios, and you'll see them there, multi-unit dwellings that are in um, five or more units, and also uh, fast charging that's publicly accessible in what the state defines as a disadvantaged community. Okay, so this is just a, a very simple example um, that shows the, the costs and the incentives for a, a, a simple project where it's one station with two plugs and it's a, a level two station. So if you look at the site work and the installation costs, those, those make ready costs for this project, they were about $9,200. Uh, it was a publicly accessible site. So uh, the incentive level was set at 90%. So that covered about $8,200. And the net out-of-pocket cost for this particular project was a little over nine hundred dollars. So uh, the the incentives are are fairly strong to to support charging in New York State. A couple of points on the process. Most important and first step, if any of you are interested, is to connect with one of the joint utilities approved installers. And that information is available on National Grid's website, I'm sure Jim's uh, NYSEG site as well as linking to approved contractors. So you'll, uh, you'll connect with one of them. They're gonna come out uh, and proceed on steps two, two through four, um, two being design. They're gonna look at the property, they're going to walk it and uh, determine the best siting for your stations and also produce a bid. Um, that approved installer is going to then work to apply on your behalf with the, the utility, uh, and typically they are the applicant. Uh, National Grid then reviews the application. Uh, we notify you, the customer, uh, the incentive level, and then you decide whether or not to proceed to construction. Contractors are also going to advise you on the different types of stations that you might install to help you select one that's best suited and uh, customizable to your business needs. Once the construction is completed and stations are activated, National Grid then reimburses uh, and provides that incentive either to you, the customer, or with your permission directly to the installer. A few words about future-proofing. Jim mentioned earlier that the Make Ready program uh, umbrella does cover future-proofing. It essentially means that we're oversizing the infrastructure to prepare for additional stations in the future. This prevents repeat disruption. So if you're looking at running line through a parking lot, we don't have to come out and dig it up again. When demand warrants more stations in the future, all you'll need to do is to purchase the stations and to pop them in the ground. So this is a really nice way to think forward and plan for the demand that we anticipate coming soon. Um, you'll want to talk to your contractor, talk to your installer about the future proofing component of your project, and they will build that into their plan that they submit to us for incentives. National Grid's Make Ready program, and I know NYSEX as well, is going to pay 100% of the future proofing costs up to 10% of the total Make Ready budget. Okay, thanks, Whitney. So, our, the, the National Grid and the NYSEG program, and frankly, all the JU programs for Make Ready are, are very similar, but there are some unique aspects to them. Um, one of those unique aspects to NYSEG is uh, an EV fleet electrification uh, pilot program that we're, we're running. So we have a consultant who has expertise in transportation electrification, and right now we are recruiting, probably through the end of October until it's full, five to 12 businesses, fleet operators who are interested in building a roadmap to fleet electrification. So there will be uh, six interactive workshops and it will walk uh, an organization with fleets through the process from introducing uh, EVs to looking at total cost of ownership to ultimately having that uh, roadmap to hopefully electrify some or all of your fleet. So if that is something that you have some interest in, please reach out to me and we can discuss that more in depth. There also are some other fleet programs. There is a fleet advisory service. Uh, there's an application for that on the New York State Joint Utilities website. 
once a utility receives that application, the utility will do a, first of all, a site feasibility analysis. So it will examine the uh, proposed EVs and the load that will be placed on the grid and then do a capacity analysis to see if the capacity existing or the existing capacity can support that load. Um, also, there is a, a rate analysis that is done. So it'll provide a few different scenarios so you can see how electric flying your fleet will impact your energy bills moving forward. There's also a medium and heavy duty make ready pilot. Uh, it's a small pilot. It, it will incentivize only the utility side make ready expenditures up to 90 percent and there are some other criteria the fleet needs to be within the nice uh, be a, an applicant or actually in the nice certa truck voucher incentive program and those fleets need to operate primarily in disadvantaged communities thanks jim a couple more notes here on incentives that you can stack with our utility side make ready programs as you can see in the table there's a variety uh, of uh, and I'll highlight that there are state and federal tax credits um, for qualified electric vehicle supply equipment. Um, in addition, EVSE or electric vehicle supply equipment may qualify for your standard business deduction as a capital improvement. So you wanna talk to your accountants about ensuring that you can capitalize on those advantages. Um, likewise, at this time, the uh, DEC is providing an EV infrastructure and equipment grant to municipalities. Um, there is a deadline of the 29th of October if you're interested and you are a municipality. Um, there's additional federal funding that we're all hearing about and anticipating as a result of the infrastructure bill that's moving through Congress at this point. Uh, we're anticipating some additional dollars for EV equipment um, that we'll be seeing in uh, 2022. And just a word of, uh, of note here, always certainly check any other funding provider at, for their timelines and for their requirements uh, as those programs may be subject to change. Uh, this Make Ready program that we're discussing today, as was represented in the first slide, will extend through December of 2025. And uh, we do have uh, plenty of uh, opportunity, plenty of charging stations uh, and plugs to put in the ground by that time. We would certainly love to connect with you, uh, both Jim and I. You're gonna see some URLs there with links to our primary program pages, as well as my email address. Um, I will make a shameless plug on our website. There's a nice 90 second explainer video which kind of gives you everything you heard today in 90 seconds. So if you need a refresher or if you're eager to share this with some other folks on your leadership teams, um, I would strongly recommend visiting that site and sending it along um, and sending an email. And I'd love to connect and have another conversation. If you have interest in the program, you can find information on our NYSEG EV Make Ready website. And you can always reach out to me uh, if you had have questions or are looking for a presentation on the program. So I'll uh, I'll just kind of wrap us up here and then turn it over to Kim. But just you know, just to bring you back to our climate strategy of electrifying the vehicle, we really set up into kind of uh, three distinct distinct phases. The first one was kind of a pilot phase, just to uh, you know basically prove that demand was there. And so about six years, seven years ago, somewhere in there, maybe even eight. Um, we put three charges, three chargers in across the campus, meaning six plugs, as Whitney explained earlier. And we put these in preferred parking locations to kind of, you know, strategically provide some incentive there. It was uh, free charging um, to, to really try to boost uh, initial early adopters. Uh, we had some, you know, growing pains, just like anything else, learning how to deal with certain things. We actually tested some equipment out in our lovely Western New York winter weather with icing and things of that nature. Um, and really then move those all forward. Um, demand in the very beginning was, you know, not terribly high. A year later though, uh, things started to build. And then by three years, we were seeing demand uh, greatly outstrip supply by the time we got towards the end. That, that would not have happened this whole piece again without the critical funding that Wendy and Jim just uh, ID'd. And that, that experience going through the pilot program really helped us 
uh, to do phase two. Uh, this is a great picture of Lorraine Collins uh, over the pandemic when we were able to, to create uh, 15 new chargers on campus, another 30 uh, different um, uh, chargers there uh, that, that the campus could use. It really took the risk out. So when we took this to senior leadership, uh, we, sh we were able to show demand and, and then really move to, to build it. We made some key changes. Um, uh, ChargePoint itself was used to be able to do the internal billing. We didn't want to be in that game. Um, and we really tried to keep the price point as low as humanly possible to incentivize that. So they, we actually pay a lower rate here than residential. So it's cheaper to charge, if you will, uh, at work. And then again, that, that, that the role the utilities played was just critical for us. And this really has given us kind of some preliminary information to really go to our ultimate goal, which, which is um, phase three, scaling um, at size. Um, and it was interesting, Whitney just, um, uh, or someone that one of the two uh, had, had talked about the number of um, vehicles that we have in Erie and Niagara County. I think we're at about 10% of that overall number is our UB affiliated people. Um, so we're, we're starting to figure out how do we, you know, if we move that even further, how do we make sure that we have the supply for that? Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Kim now to, to close us out. Thank you, Ryan. The trend is coming. It's happening. <laughs> Um, and, and we couldn't be more excited about that. You know, Gen Z's are demanding it and you can create a real differentiator uh, for your business and having them come to you versus your competition by having this accessible electric charging vehicle at your business. Just to wrap it up, we are about um, clean energy in, in the Buffalo Niagara region. Uh, we are working with our partners on a regular basis taking advantage of the resources in our area. Um, I'm gonna put in a couple of shameless plugs. Um, right now we're doing a economic gardening program for our existing businesses because we wanna be able to uh, take existing businesses and see what their potential could be in scaling. So if you're interested in learning about what we have available to help you scale and uh, increase your business and hiring opportunities, new job creation and investment, um, feel free to reach out to me and uh, Olivia Hill. Um, if you're interested in learning about recharge, we did a webinar on that a while ago, but powering your business with clean energy, we want to take care of the businesses that are in our region and make sure they're taking advantage of the programs available. So a reminder to attendees, you can type questions into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and we're going to begin that portion of this presentation today. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, although we do have a few already, um, I will let you know that we will be following up this presentation with an email uh, that will include some additional links as well as a recording to this presentation. And as Kim mentioned, um, you can view past recordings like the recharge webinar that we did um, on our YouTube channel and certainly uh, see additional assets on our website. So let's get started with the q and I'm gonna pull up our first question for the panelists. Um, and we have uh, the question E is an EV driver um, and wants to know if New York State have any programs or initiatives in place to promote the environmentally sound and social just transition to the production manufacturing of the infrastructure required for electric mobility. So globally in the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, um, which was passed, uh, enacted roughly a year and a half, two years ago, great, I think, mandates in that, is that I believe it was around 40% of the capital and resources that go into that need to go um, into communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, et cetera, uh, and, and targeting that funding so that we're thinking not just about climate action, but climate justice and making sure uh, that, that we're providing that access to, to people who need it, right? So I think one of the probably rightful criticisms of EVs so far, if you, if you kind of look at the classic Elon Musk Tesla component is, you know, toys for the wealthy, et cetera. Um, what we're starting to see though, is that I think that was the case in the, in the beginning of that. What we've started to see is a huge democratization of that and the importance of linking things like asthma and um, clean air to the electrification of the vehicle and making sure that the benefits of that are going into communities who have disproportionately um, suffered in that. There are a lot of programs in New York State, um, both funding and programs as well, that are pushing towards that. 
um, as well as a lot of electric vehicle um, incentivization um, for um, uh, fleets and pilots and things of that nature. Um, I'll, I'll just make a few comments. Ryan referred to the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act of uh, 2019, which set forth the, that expectation of the 40%. Um, as, a, as a part of that, there's a Climate Action Council that's been formed that kind of sits in, in uh, throughout the state represented by members from the industry, members from community, and also many nonprofit organizations in uh, what's, what is called an environmental justice working group. So there's the Climate Action Council and uh, reporting to that council is an environmental justice working group that is uh, putting together plans and, as Ryan said, taking into consideration the full scope of impacts and how they can be equitably distributed across communities of need. Um, within the uh, Make Ready program, there is the incentive for certain projects that are located in disadvantaged communities. So we provide a higher incentive. And um, also, as Jim mentioned, the NYSERDA Clean Energy Prizes is looking to identify community-based organizations that are putting together projects, um, one of which I know that has applied is a rideshare for this region that would look to link uh, in communities of need with um, mobility through electric vehicle rideshare. So setting up a network of um, stations and vehicles that would connect folks to their places of work, to their places of shopping, and um, you know, really kind of work through some of those transportation challenges that people have living in in um, in areas of, of poverty and um, and and juggling those needs. Thank you. That definitely answered the question. Maybe Whitney, where does the funding come from for this incentive exactly? Great question. Um, it is a ratepayer funded program. So it comes from you, it comes from me, it comes from all of us. And that is another, I think, major reason why we want to be sure that everyone takes advantage. Um, is this program available statewide or just Western New York? And I believe I can answer that, that that's statewide, correct? Yes, it is. And I, I will also add one element. The different utilities have different sized programs. Um, we have different goals based on the number of customers that we serve. So National Grid's portion of that uh, 50,000 plug goal is 16,000 plugs, um, utilizing $143 million of the 700. I don't know if Jim, you have those numbers. Uh, from a plug standpoint, it's about uh, between NYSEG and rg and &E, it's about 13,500 level two charger or level two plugs, and then an additional roughly 400 uh, DC fast charging plugs. Okay, so some questions on funding too. Is there a cost for that third party that has to be used or how, how are they you know, funded? Maybe it's the actual, uh, I think they may be referring to the actual vendor who's- The contractor, who's the vendor, correct. So the incentive typically for the infrastructure side cost would be assigned by the customer to the installer. So you, the customer, would give the utility permission to assign the incentive to your installer, and then the balance of costs would be taken care of by the customer. So the customer would pay the installer. And any additional costs, signage, bollards, other uh, soft costs uh, to accentuate the project would be then also the customer's responsibility. Jim had a nice example there. It's, it is a nice incentive, right? That they showed um, what really ends up being the customer versus what the savings is. Um, and then after that, you know, um, getting the stations set for use, can you give any kind of idea of what type of cost goes into that? Yeah, so um, at least if you look at the level two chargers, so those those prices I would say are you know, a little all over the board. You know, it really depends on the manufacturer of the equipment. I would say in general, see see if Whitney agrees, I would say in general, a, a commercial level two charger with two plugs is probably anywhere from roughly 5,000 to $7,500. That's what we see as well. So if you're talking about your total project costs between the infrastructure and the equipment, the incentives for the infrastructure side will cover uh, you know, the vast majority of that side of the project. It's about, I would say, between 60 and 70% of total project costs. The other portion 
um, would be the, the cost of the stations and also any other soft costs. And as I mentioned, the other incentives, both state and federal tax incentives, as well as um, you know any other uh, business costs that you can write off, those may be a, a very significant cost savings toward the purchase of the stations. NYSERDA also may have a program in the future. They had one in the past. Um, as I said, there's a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, we do anticipate some federal funding next year. So keep an eye on that for the hardware side of the project. And we will certainly be working with our customers to inform them when and if new funding opens to enable the purchase of the stations. Yeah, that's great, Whitney. I was just gonna add from a customer perspective, it took me a little while to kind of figure it out because you are kind of um, combining different incentive pools. And I think, you know, Whitney's and Jim have kind of ID three, two applied to us, but three probably for most of you, which is, you know, the, the lion's share of this, at least in our case, by far was the utility, was the make ready program. And that was, uh, we think of it from, you know, from the meter to the charger, if you will, or from the building. And so the run, um, which is just, again, it's just the most resource intensive. Um, and that's the piece that the utilities are, you know, covering um, for us. It was, I, I can't remember Whitney, but I think it was 100%, 90% or somewhere in there. So it was a no brainer um, in that sense. The charger itself, and I have um, great confidence that the state of New York will re-up that program at NYSERDA. Uh, that's another 7,000, up to 7,000 per charger, uh, which can cover 100% as Jim just kind of outlaid that, that price point. Um, so you really can, at the end of the day, we we penciled ours out at like very little, lot, some university time and effort and things of that nature and coordination, but very little um, outfront capital that we had to put on it. And then that third piece that, again, we're not able to take advantage of as much, but um, are the tax implications uh, that, that you can use as a business. So if you kind of think of it within that bucket, it, it, um, it again, to me, it's, it's really a no-brainer. It's very little risk on, on the business side. And if I can just interject, um, so the uh, National Grid and Nice Eggs Wait West uh, websites are a great place to keep updated on this. Um, Invest Buffalo Niagara at buffaloniagara.org. We always have blogs about this type of information that's for the betterment of our community. Um, we've had uh, webinars and um, our podcast, Bell Ringer. Um, has gotten a lot of attention bringing things to light that other people will be interested in. Um, so check that out. Um, for those of you that are lifelong learners, there's a lot going on in our community and Invest Buffalo Niagara likes to poise itself as a, a resource place, our website, so you can look it up. Thanks. Just a couple more questions. Um, Jim, you were talking about fleet vehicles. Uh, what type of companies are you working with on the fleet incentive? Can you give some an example or two? Yeah, sure. I, I think the, the the companies or the organizations that are that are interested in fleet electrification so far, uh, colleges and universities. Uh, we, we've had a refuse uh, company that's interested in in electrifying their fleet. Um, I think municipalities are also uh, uh, somewhere else where we're seeing uh, high interest in fleet electrification. So I'd say so far, those are probably the big, um, the big few areas uh, that are interested in, in fleet electrification. We've been talking a lot about cars, fleets. Uh, one person did ask if their employees have electric motorcycles, are there stations for those? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that because I, um, I don't know what those vehicles are using as a plug port. Um, and if they're using a universal level two, which is what we all use, um, or if you're using a Tesla, you use an adapter for that that they give you, then the answer is yes, you can charge it any of those that are that are open to the public, right? Which all of ours are. Um, it is interesting because you know there's a range of, of electrification that's going on. And that last question and this question just kind of brought together one. One end, you have the, the electric scooters, which we see all over campus right now, and which are not charged through that. They're just a regular 110 outlet. And at the other end, Jim just talked about a refuge, a refuse company, et cetera. So we've got some fleet vehicles uh, that are mainly passenger vehicles, et cetera, on the campus right now. 
where we see things going and where we really want them to go is the light duty trucks. And we're just starting to see those really come out onto the market at scale right now. If you happen to watch the Bills game, which I'm thinking a large chunk of our viewership may hear, and, and back to Kim's message of, uh, of Ford at the beginning, you can't go through that without seeing one of the F-150 um, commercials on the electrification of that, which is really interesting because they're bringing in the whole resiliency aspect and being able to power your home and things of that nature. So there's just a lot of really neat things, I think, happening um, on the fleet side right now, in addition to the charging infrastructure that you need to have to before you get those vehicles. And one last question to wrap it up. Um, but Kim, uh, you know, if somebody is interested in, in doing some additional expansion projects locally in the Buffalo Niagara region, an existing company, at what point should they be reaching out to you? Um, as soon as you have the idea, reach out. Um, we are engaging with companies as early as possible because a lot of the partners that we work with um, have a but for clause. And we want to make sure that we're, our companies are taking advantage of these things, um, not after the fact and after they've started, you know, hiring people and are making the expenditures, um, but ahead of the time so that we can take advantage of all of the resources available uh, before they get uh, really far down the road into the project. Um, and as Ryan will attest to and with me and Jim, um, we're working really hard uh, with our partners to make this process easier. And, and there is assistance available to help you with that type of thing. At Invest Buffalo Niagara, we have another webinar happening on October 21st around accelerating the food processing industry. And then we're also looking at another Be in Buffalo event in January, a virtual career fair, because it was so significant and so popular last time. So um, because Buffalo is such an organic city, and things happen because we're talking to our, our friends and our partners and our investors. I wanted to get the word out there to keep on our social media to see when those next events are going to happen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you being at this presentation. And I have to have a big thank you to Kim, Whitney, Jim, and Ryan for joining me today. Uh, your emails are here on the screen for our audience is welcome to reach out to you with any additional questions. 